With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef David Waite, my man. Chef David, are you feeling unstoppable today? I uh, actually am. <laughs> nice. I cannot wait to dive into your story. I love the path you took, but we don't want to give away any teasers. We'll just let the, the audience find out later. Uh, in the mid-90s, after being hired at Ichiban in Santa Barbara, California, David Waite made the decision to drop out of college to chase his newfound passion, food. After a few years of being mentored by local legend Chef Hiro, Waite made the move to San, Di San Diego where he was where he weaseled his way into the kitchen at Cafe, say this for me. Cafe Japango. Japango, thank you, where he was where he further refined his skills. Six years later, Waite opened his first business, the Fish Joint, which later rebranded as Pickled Ginger and Catering and Events, uh, which was followed by Wrench and Rodent, Sebastro Pub, and the Wet Noodle, all located in Oceanside, California. Uh, for his next project, he is partnering with uh, Jessica Waite and Christopher Logan to open the plant-based zero-waste restaurant named The Plot. you got a lot going on. I cannot wait to find out how you got to where you are today in the lessons you've learned along the way. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quarter mantra. What do you got for us? So, got two. Nice. Joe Strummer, big Clash fan. Okay. Future is unwritten. Nice. Means we get to get to write it however we want, and I I honestly believe that. While uh, while trying to write the future, one thing I try to always keep in mind is to live in a way that the teenager version of myself would be proud of me. And that means as far as doing the right thing, and it also means don't ever grow up. Yes, yeah, staying young, right? And yeah. Sorry, I cut you short. Keep going. No, no fun in growing up. No, I love it, man. And diving more with, um, you know, you said, write, write it how you, wait, what was the first quote? Drop, drop that first quote on me one more time. The future is unwritten. The future is unwritten. How does that resonate with you? How does that influence who you are today? Um. Basically, we can do anything, yeah. you know, like it's it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but we can. You yeah. Know? And also looking at the world and the state that certain things are in right now, it's like, yeah, we can change it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It is exciting. I think th knowing that really like your creation is the limit, whatever you can create is the limit. And having that mentality lets you think outside the box. It really like inhibits you from being limited right yeah um which is su super important so where does it make sense to start telling your story take us to that moment i think um <clears throat> probably the beginning you know i was i was born here in oceanside hospital right right up the road uh english parents and i got to grow up between two very different worlds living here most of the year and living over there in the summertime okay um my aunt had a, a pub and, uh, you know, that side of the family, my dad's sister. Okay. Um, and my dad, uh, that side of the family was super into food. So food was always super special. And a lot of the zero waste stuff kind of was ingrained in me right then because they were all the generation in England that grew up right after the war and they didn't have Didn't much. have a choice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you had a better chance letting an f-bomb slip at the dinner table than you did wasting your food <laughs> so that you know just getting out of being lucky enough to be born in such an amazing bubble like north san diego county but being able to get out of that bubble at a early age and see that there's a whole world out there right? it was it was huge nice what was you know is it just the fact that like I think we, like you said, we're, when we're on the West coast or in, in, in the West in general, right. We get kind of in this bubble where we take certain things for granted. Do yeah. you think that being able to see outside of this bubble kind of influenced who you are and the decisions you were making going forward? Definitely. How so? Um, I mean, there's, and there's going other places than just England. I mean, you don't really, well, these days you, even within the bubble, you see people who are definitely not as well off as us yeah and you know it makes you really want to do the best you can to make a difference i love it and it also makes you want to honor what what you have yeah. too so at one point you were on a track you were going to school like you were on the, yeah. the traditional middle class track right yep and you you were taken off that track uh what what were you going to school for i'm curious um psychology okay uh, yeah. how long did you last were they a year or two in college what was yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't last very long. <laughs> Made it about halfway through. So did you learn anything during this time in college that you think kind of helped? I mean, psychology oh, yeah. is one of those things. Like what? Everything helps along the way. Oh, and yeah. Understanding, no matter what you do, it, you're dealing with humans. Yeah. And um, you can make that a positive experience, and some people make it a negative experience. I believe that, I mean, humans are such a 
big you can't take the humans out of stuff yeah. and have it have any sort of soul yeah and i don't know if i'm just making this up but honestly if sometimes it feels like there's a correlation between the people that i'm interviewing and the fact that they went to school for psychology or something that's very people driven and one, one of the biggest lessons i've learned is that like really this this industry is about relationships right it is and when you can when you study people psychology right i feel like people that that recognize the the power of understanding how people work and how that ties into business um is so impactful do you want to reflect on that and and just caring about other people too you know yeah yeah um for me it's you know there's a food chain and there's there's this chain of how the food is when it gets to me yeah if i shorten that chain and know that a certain product was given as much love every link of that chain it's going to be a better product Mm. might not be able to put your finger on it you might not be able to say well the leaves are greener or this or that and maybe it's the sum of a lot of different things it's a compound effect right like little 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 differences compound over time and there's no big thing in cooking Mm. you know how do you be better than the next guy not Mm. that you really want to you know ideally where we are now in san diego is how do we all help each other to Mm. make the overall scene better i think we'll get into that before you when, know? as we progress into your story but w- when you first like you didn't have any idea that you were going to make your life all about food at this point in your life when you're no. studying psychology right i it, it was a weird one it i'd been into cooking and food since i could reach the stove and i i've always loved it it's just at that point in time you didn't tell your middle class parents that you were going to drop out of college and what, be what a is cook. this point in time? Give us a date. This was, uh, I think 1995, 94 around that time. 90, 96 okay. when I was in full time. This is before and the food network really took off and everybody started oh, yeah. to glorify I mean, the chef. Right? You might as well just say, Hey dad, I'm hopping on a pirate ship or <laughs> I'm going to go join the circus. It's pretty, pretty cool. No, no offense to pirate <laughs> ships or circuses because yeah. both of which are very cool. Right? Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was, it was more that, you know, it was more feeling, you know, it's kind of what you were supposed to do. And I mean, let's be honest, there's not really a whole lot of money in, in the food game. Yeah. You know, I want to find out what made you fight against the grain because, um, I mean, there must've been something really impactful that happened when you first walked into a restaurant, maybe take us through that first experience, like why you went to the restaurant in the first place for a job, or was it just, you're looking for money? Like take us through it. The very first restaurant was summer job immediately graduated um graduated high school gotcha uh applied to be a server put um on things that you're into put that i liked cooking because my little brother who's now the yeah. cbc here which is a um, funny story because you guys look so much alike and he told me he was you when i first came here and pulled the fast one on me but dude, i don't want to digress yeah. <laughs> keep going he's so funny <laughs> um no he's like yeah put that you like cooking on there you know so i mean it was like any other california kid surfing and skate you know all yeah. the stuff we do but yeah. then it, cooking and they took one look at it and they're like oh no you don't want to cook you don't want to wait tables you want to you want to make sushi. Yeah, they got you. You know? <laughs> and uh, I mean, I immediately felt like I was home. And nice. you know what? It, it was the circus and it was a pirate ship all rolled into one. And I loved every single minute of it. Which it, part of it specifically made you feel at home? Is it because you were with other people like you or what was it exactly? There was the other people like me. There was the rush of, you know, getting getting it handed to you you know like what do you mean getting it handed to you? like just like getting bent over and handed to you like, yeah yeah <laughs> getting a bunch of food out this this was summertime yeah. uh that restaurant was in carlsbad yeah and it was it was non-stop i mean they i was in over my head from the get-go and i love that rush so i've always tried to keep myself in a position where i'm in over my head because yeah. that's the next thing that's most appealing is learning yes. there was something different and something cool. And then there was the Japanese culture aspect, which was something different and cool. And it, yeah. it all made, made sense, yeah. you know, like there, are, you know, there's levels of respect and no matter what job you did, you took pride in it and certain things that have gotten lost in our culture. And it was like, Whoa, this is, and there were other things that were, weird because it's kind of disrespectful to ask them questions because it's like you're questioning them not wanting in our culture is one where we're kind of taught to ask questions yeah and i mean true. always question 
always ask, especially if you're questioning authority, you know? So two like, things we, we got to pull to the service and really highlight here that, that you love to exist in that area of discomfort where you don't know. And when you're, when you're uncomfortable, you're forced to grow, right? Yep. That, and learn to embrace discomfort because that's where growth happens. And the second part is just being willing to ask questions. How would you approach people in a way where, where your questions weren't necessarily insulting? Cause like you said, like, um, you're, you're taught to, you know, you're not questioning yeah. their authority. Uh, but how did you approach these questions to learn it and not insult people or not to be a pain in the ass? In that culture, I found the best way to do it was to do something wrong and get caught doing something wrong. So they'd come over and tell you so the were right you doing way. Things on, wrong Cause, on purpose cause there's to get also, their there's also the language barrier. Okay. That's true. So, so what, you, are, we, are we talking like, a uh, like Mexican or Spanish language or Japanese? Japanese. Okay. I, they, they were, um, there was a little bit of Spanish in there. Okay. And then the Japanese could speak Spanish and the Mexicans could speak Japanese. So I kind of had to figure out how to at least understand both languages. So I knew what, what the hell they were saying about me, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, it was, uh, I mean, in, in, in all other, in other cultures, it's, uh, and, and now, you know, time has changed the older generations where, it's a bit more staunch have kind of, uh, died off, moved out. And, you know, now it's, a, it's a lot more lax, you know, most, if it's a genuine question, most chefs are going to be stoked that somebody's interested in what they're doing. Just don't ask them the same question for the love of God. Don't ask them the same question three times in a row Yeah, and bring a notebook and a yeah. pen yes. and write it down. It's you so know, powerful. nobody does that anymore, but like, in 30 years, you're going to be so stoked to go back and look at that notebook. Plus, there'll be, it'll be enough to be your own cookbook. Yeah, I love that. And um, I mean, we're, you said earlier that you um, would make mistakes to see if they would. Was that how you'd get their attention? Would you would you intentionally do it slightly wrong to like Sometimes. spark the conversation? Yeah. Would you recommend people doing that? To no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's interesting to do whatever you can to to you know invoke that lesson right into uh -huh. the to encourage people to teach you is so powerful and it's you know you, you got to put your ego on the shelf but i mean ego never i mean there's chefs out there with ego there's there's cooks out there with ego you know like but really how does it serve you it's mm. it's a barrier between the knowledge that you're supposed to be looking for and you know uh and whoever's gonna show you that yes. right so you know you, you mentioned too um the just the power of asking questions. I think a lot of people are afraid to ask questions because it reveals their ignorance, right? And it, it yeah. makes you vulnerable. But the truth is, and like you said, if you ask questions, it will show the people that are mentoring you that you do have an interest, that you yeah. are passionate, but you got to, sometimes you got to, you got to take yeah. that initiative and you it, can't assume that people will know that you want to know. So in, as long as you're, you're learning and if you're, and if you're taking the notes, then you're, you're, you're communicating that you give a fuck, which is really oh, important totally. too. And then they're going to see that they're going to, the people will notice this shit, right? Do you want oh, yeah. to, they'll wanna... move up. They'll definitely move up faster. I mean, sure. And you know, once you get past that whole realizing that it's okay to not know everything, like, can you imagine if, if any of us did know everything, right? How boring well, would life be? Exactly. We're and, in, keep and going, keep I don't going. want to be that guy anyway. Cause that's too <laughs> much fucking responsibility. Yeah. And you I think know? it's important to know that, that we are meant to, we're, we're tribal by nature, right? Yeah. We, we are meant to do a few things really well and rely on the rest of the tribe to do what they do really well. So yeah, like you said, you can't know everything and it's okay. It's, it's natural not to know everything. Um, I want to dive deeper into this concept of keeping a notebook because I feel like for everybody, it's, it's probably not that intuitive, right? Uh, what, what do I do? Do I just start writing down recipes? Like what, what approach have, did you take with your notebook and how has keeping a notebook evolved for you? What, what, what advice so, do you have? For me, when I, after I weaseled my way into Japango, I had, and obviously I didn't know as much at this time as I thought I did, but I'd gone from, you know, being able to work on the sushi bar and do some cooking. The only job available there was rice boy, which, you know, start at six thirty in the morning, make eight to 12 big batches of rice back to back. And it better be perfect because you had 12 of the best chefs in San Diego at the time <laughs> who were all going to give you tons of shit. I yeah. mean, if you made bad rice, you were bumming their whole night out, you know? Yeah. So it was a very rapid learning curve. Yeah. So I was given a menu to master and a bunch of tasks to master. And I was instructed on everything once because it was a super busy restaurant, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I, it was my, you know, at, at this, it wasn't like it slowed down for me to record. So at lightning speed, I had to 
take notes, anything that would remind me how to do it, notes on plating, uh, little drawings if it helped, uh, recipe processes, ratios, everything like that, it was thrown down in that book. Yeah. You know, at a later point in time, you know, I always had like a quick record part of the book and then a part where I would go home later and kind of like clean up my thoughts, you know, one front and back or, you know, you can make the book one way read Japanese, yep. you know, like. Okay. backwards and then you flip <laughs> it the other way and it's it's the clean side oh, okay. but really it's whatever works best for you know for for you for the individual um and it's that connection between writing something out in the brain and then you got the cheat sheet also yeah. you yeah. know so i think what i'm pulling from you this process that you're using you first start by just writing down the standard they're going to yeah. tell you exactly how it's supposed to come out you write that standard down so you have that standard like documented yep. and then it sounds like what you're doing is you're fine tuning the process to to increase consistency to get to that standard like yeah. like i did this thing differently and you know when when i you know leave the rice in for 30 seconds longer it comes out like yeah. the, you know, like these little fine tuned things so you can get it closer more consistent to that standard totally does that kind of sound like the process you're taking yeah because okay. the notes can always change yeah because they're the notes as they apply to the job you're at yeah but that could be the basis of your own recipes you know, that notebook yeah, goes with you exactly. and whatever changes you make and whatever you learn along the way. Are you just writing yeah. about food in that notebook or are you also writing about like life lessons and business lessons? Do you get personal? Um, for me, it was all about food. Okay. You know, um, I guess you could. I yeah. mean, it would be, it, it would be interesting if I, depends on how you're if wired. I had. I yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, we haven't even spoken about chef, uh, hero who, um, I don't know how much of a mentor he was to you. If he was, if you were kind of mentored through somebody that he mentored, um, is it worth hovering over this individual? Did you learn anything that you, Oh yeah. Apply? Huge, huge. Not he necessarily was, about food, but so, about business and how to carry yourself in business. He was, you know, and, and keep in no, keep, keep in mind. I was a, I got into the business real early. I was barely 17 when I started. Um, and I was a bit of an animal. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, what sense? Uh, just partying my ass off, well, you know. Aren't, weren't we all at 17? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm i stoked he put up with me. But I was super into my job, you know. Yeah. Like, I, I did not, you know, work came first. But. I'm sure lines got blurred, you know. Yep. I'm, I'm sure my memory <laughs> has me being a little more innocent than I probably was. I hear you. But he was great. He took this scrappy kid in, similar thing. You know, I I'd, I'd moved from where I was to Santa Barbara to um, go Your to college. Oceanside, I moved to Santa Barbara. Yeah. Yep. And um, just thought, you know, didn't think they'd take me seriously, dropped off resumes all over for anything just because you know i needed work and um i i you know there was that draw because obviously i'm dropping them off at sushi bars and that hope that you know i would be able to continue what i'd started learning but um it, it worked and i think it was easter sunday oh uh, sometime in the late Are we 90s talking about getting the job at ichiban yeah okay yeah. cool keep on um so you know they're like yeah okay yeah we need a sushi chef you know, come, come back. And part of the reason we were a little different from the get go. Um, and me as a, as a chef is uh hero was from Hokkaido. So he was from Northern Japan Okay, where, you know, a lot of Japanese restaurants loosely are around like, you know, you got Tokyo style, Edo style, which was Tokyo and Osaka style, you know, like that's a lot of what people see. Yeah. So Sapporo, you know, I mean, it snows there a lot, like mm. 200 and something days a year. It's, it's snowing. So, because of that, two great things happened. You know, number one is all the crazy pickles and all that fun stuff right. was something I got to learn. And the other cool thing that happened because of that is when Hero was a kid, he got really bored and hopped on a cruise ship, cooked French food, cooked Italian food, oh, landed, man. got off this cruise ship in the 70s when sushi, because sushi as we know it was born in Los Angeles in the late 70s. Got you. Um, and that was about when he cruise ship pulled into port he gets off and he's looking at you know like axel rose right welcome to the jungle <laughs> so he stayed <laughs> oh, and eventually crazy. moved up to santa barbara um god it seemed everybody seemed old to me back then you know i mean he's <laughs> gotta be 80 by now that's you know? crazy so uh, he's up there last i heard he was uh 
working in a restaurant in Dubai. Still, still at it, you know, which oh, is funny. His because, name is going on my checklist. I'm yeah, going I, to Dubai. I, I got to track him down. I, he came back to San Diego later, which uh, that'll take us down a whole nother tangent. But we kept in touch for a while. And then in the last couple of years, lost touch. But I've been trying to track him down because I, I want him to see this place. That'd be amazing. I, I just want to see how he's doing and, and tell bet. the guy thank you. Um, what did you, who was or who is Chef Hero? to you like what what qualities do you think that he imprinted on you well the the first one was you know at this point professionally the focus had been on sushi you know i could always and that meant like you know if you wanted a shrimp for your role you had to at least know how to prep the shrimp fry the shrimp you know all of that and if your customer you know kitchen guy was on break yeah you could go back and cook a teriyaki steak you know um, wasn't like a lot of the Japanese restaurants outside of sushi side of the menu were super high end back then. And if they were around, they were kind of only for the upper class, you know, it was before the sushi explosion in the United States. But the biggest thing he'd all, you know, he was also a great French chef and Italian chef, and he'd show me French food and Italian food. If I got all of my, my stuff done. So Ichiban for me was like elementary through high school. Okay. You know, Japan Go is probably like university. And the biggest thing, you know, is the day I left. He was like, you know, look, don't just do sushi. Do it all. You know. Why do you think that was his advice to you? I think he could probably see that I was interested in it. I think it was also that it was a path that he had followed. And maybe it was advice that somebody had given him. Yeah, because he did know how to do it all. And he's still to this date, one of the best people I have seen at, you know, and I'm lucky enough to have a lot of chef friends and, you know, at, at each one of those different yeah. types of food. Yeah, I think the other underlying lesson here, I mean, we learned we, we learned part the other side of it when you were saying just ask questions, right? Take yeah. notes. But when you see somebody asking questions and taking notes, you have an obligation to that person to feed that funnel, to give them oh, that yeah. knowledge you're seeking. And it seems like, it seems like he recognized that and that he made time to, to give you these other lessons. He didn't have to teach you about Italian cuisine or French cuisine. Yeah. You were at a sushi restaurant. What, how would that benefit him? Right? Totally. He was thinking about you. Do you want to reflect on that? Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, every step of the way throughout my career, I've had people like that. And you know, I've already said I was, I was a pain in the ass. I wasn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I wasn't the teacher's an angel. <laughs> pet in a lot of other ways, but you know, they, they all, I was lucky cause they all had a soft spot for me. Mm. And, um, I think, you know, I think when we see it, it reminds, it reminds us of us when we were younger. And I think that that feeling goes all the way up and down the family tree. Yeah. Before we move on, I think there's something else underlying here that, that we can bring to the surface. And you keep on saying, like, you, you show that you had the passion, the curiosity. Uh, you were taking notes. Your actions were speaking volumes, right? Um, but what else were you doing that you think to help people develop a soft spot for you? Was there any other ways, any ways we can uh, mimic your behavior to help people kind of want to get in our corner? Um. I think I, I tried, I think I, <laughs> I listen, you know, like it's that extra little bit of it, attentiveness, you know, I think that will kind of allow you to be able to look the other way when you do. Show yeah. Up and maybe, I, maybe like... I was a bit of an underdog. <laughs> okay. Maybe that's what it was, you know? Um, I, can I can relate to that. What made you an underdog? Well, nothing. I mean, I come from middle class, North San Diego County, you know, I mean, I guess I wasn't the easy bet. Right. It's gotcha. a better way to say gotcha. it. Cool. So any other lessons, uh, life lessons, business lessons at Ichiban that you can drop on us before moving to the next stage of your life? Um, not that, you know, maybe later me, on, a lot of it was about food. The best, the best lesson I got from Ichiban aside from the others came afterwards. Right. When, you know, Afterwards, how long? Uh, afterwards? Like I had moved back here. Got you. And Oceanside, or we were uh, working in San Diego at this point. Oceanside. Before so, you know, I, I'd moved back, and um, I got a call, and Hero had left. He was opening a um, another uh, Japanese. It was like a 
night three story big sushi bar one level pool tables on another nightclub on nice. another down on, on state street in santa barbara and it, it, it's come and gone since then but he called me up and he was like hey i'm opening a restaurant want to be my sous chef and i was you know you know love was showed in a lot of different ways back then in, yeah in that culture right wait so this but, is this at the fish joint when you're opening the fish joint or before the fish joint this was before right before cafe japango gotcha so this was probably we're looking at like 98 98 yeah. um he's like yeah you want to come be my sous chef and i'm like dude i i i don't know what uh you know like thank you i'm honored but you know i just didn't think you liked me very much well, for, you for know perspective you met this guy in 95 so three years later he's offering you the sous chef the shoe the yeah. sous chef position that's that's a big I mean, step in three I, years I, from I, I i was lucky i learned learn fast you know yeah. like i i picked up i paid attention maybe that's I, one of the things I, he saw on you is that i you cared had it. yeah yeah you know and i wasn't you know it i mean i, I definitely 100 percent every step of the way no matter what else was going on in my life and what you know issues i had like i loved this fucking job yeah you know like there is no way to hide it you know <laughs> i don't and think we got maybe to the lesson. He, maybe he noticed that you know <laughs> we still haven't gotten but, to the, the final oh, lesson. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah the final lesson you know it was like well, you know, I'm I'm kind of thinking about staying down here. You know, I would I otherwise I would, but you know, I just didn't think you liked me that much. You know, he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> if I didn't like you, you wouldn't have been here. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, and so and the whole idea is, you know, like, you know, I was hard on you because I cared about you, yeah. kind of thing. And these days, if somebody's hard on somebody in a kitchen, the guy storms out and goes to the next place. Yeah. So what do you, you want know? us to take away from that? You know. I mean, now we have human resources departments that have more say in what goes on in the kitchen than the chefs. And I'm not saying that yelling at people is an effective means of communication. I think mankind has evolved and there's different ways to communicate and we can, you know, motivate through inspiration and all of that. But, you know, it does pay to have a thick skin and, you know, don't compromise your education just because you don't like the way somebody's talking to you. Nice. If they got, if it's worth it and they got something to teach you, you know, put yeah. your ego on the cell on the shelf, take the shit because yeah, I know what they were doing. They were beating that into me mm -hmm. so that when you're on the line, you don't got to think about it. Mm. And no matter how mean they could have been nowhere near as nasty as a room full of hungry people who want their food and you just screwed something up. They're toughening you up, man. You know what I mean? Thick skin, like, like you said, I love it, man. Uh, so we, we got to go to the next experience in your life. Um, say the name of this restaurant, cafe, cafe, Japango, Japango. So thank you. What it was, was this is, uh, I was there from 98 to 2004, I think 99, 98, 99, late 98. From 98 to 2004. Six yeah, years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what it was, this is before fusion became the culinary F word. Um, it was still, <laughs> it was still hot. It was still a thing. We were still stacking plates as high as we could. And that was, you know, artful presentation, you know, parsley and, uh, lemon it, slices and whole apples had yeah. gone out of the garnish you were quoted window as, by then. You were quote, quoted as saying this, you want to get a job here. Cause this was like the place at the, the place to be at the time. Oh, it was, unquote. it was so what like, made it the place to be. It was the roaring twenties of, uh, of, of sushi, you mm. know? Um, but yeah, so Japango, the name was Marco, Marco Polo's name he gave to the Orient when he first discovered it. So that okay. embodied the whole East meets West kind oh, of thing going nice. on. I like that. Um, that's why it has such a, such a funny name. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> um, <laughs> Sorry about no, that. No, you're good at me. Uh, We're but, uh, a what, what, what made it cool? <laughs> I think what made it cool, it was way ahead of its time. It was owned by the Hyatt, um, and it was opened up across the street from the Hyatt. Hotel food at that point in time had kind of a, you know, it was hotel food. But they'd given this restaurant its own identity. And everybody that worked at that restaurant, you know, that's where you had the guys with blue hair. Damn, I had every color hair. You know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, and this, you know, it, we weren't, we didn't have the same dress code as the hotel. It was still strict. If you showed up with any like scruff, you know, you were going to get well, sent with we, a razor and shaving cream to the bathroom. You had yeah, to be clean, but you could be different. You know, well, we've heard I mean, through past guests that it's good. If, if you're opening a restaurant in a hotel, 
you got to do everything you can to be your own brand separate of the hotel. Yeah. Uh, going as far as even creating your own entrance and brand away oh, from yeah. the hotel to kind of get that separate identity. So it's, I think it's a good thing. That it's you guys so, that. And, and this, you know, they opened in, I think it was 1988 that they opened. Well, so they'd figured this stuff out back then. Yeah. And, it, it, and it's still true. You yeah. Know? And they had a 30 year run. They, I think yeah. what I saw was 90, 1990 to 2018, almost 30 year run, three decades, which in this industry is a, a long time. Who so there's that. Yeah. You you know? want, yeah. Of course you want to be on this. So, team. And I think the other thing, the chefs were known as like this elite, squad that you know just badasses we had you know it was an appealing job because we had the hyatt's benefits free hotel rooms paid vacation you know paid well 401k all of all of that good stuff so at that point in time i had no i no sweet you know i was going to go work for the hyatt for the rest of my life you know um and it was just it was where all the cool kids went yeah one thing i love about your story um, and we have to get into it is you, you literally told the head chef that you were going to walk that line between showing your enthusiasm or, or maybe you didn't tell him this, but you, you, you the quote that I have is literally told the, the head chef that I was going to walk that line between showing my enthusiasm and bugging the living shit out of him until he hired me. And I did that. And I think that's so important. And we need to we need to highlight that because. You're, you, you are the average of those you surround yourself with, so you got to do whatever it takes to get on that team, whether it means getting denied five times in a row yeah. or starting with cooking the rice, which is back to where we were talking about earlier. You got onto this team by taking that job where you cooked yeah. the rice. You started at the bottom after three or four years of working with a master chef, right? How humbling was that? It was humbling, and it was hard to wake up in the morning. You know? <laughs> what time did you have and to be there? Six thirty. Damn. Keep in mind, I was, you know, wasn't sleeping a whole lot at you're the 23, time. You're twenty three, twenty four at this time, or you're, um, you were the young twenties. I think I was even younger. I had my twenty first birthday while while working okay. there. Oh, oof, rough. So yeah, it, <laughs> those are some was, fun times. You know, and you know, I think, um, oh, back then. You know, you get to your 30s and then it starts catching up with you. But, you know, there's that period of uh, perceived invincibility. And uh, I did a good job of using every little bit of that. Yeah. You know, but I think the, the lesson is just do whatever it takes, even if it means working for free, because, you mm-hmm. know, you might not be making anything like tangible that you can put in your pocket right away. But that knowledge that you're getting and that network that yeah. you're starting is invaluable. And I think what, you saw that. What would somebody pay for school? Right. What do people pay for college? Yeah. You know, the, the best thing. A lot thing, more than free. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- there were jobs I worked where I swear I was making less than minimum wage should have been. And that was when minimum wage was like right below four bucks. Yeah. You know, right in there. Um, and pe- nobody would think about yeah. doing that now. But like it, the, the, there were no student loans to repay at the yeah. end of it. You know. Do me a favor, um, pull that mic a little bit closer to your face. You can actually grab the whole thing and pull it right in. There yeah, we go. There you go. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, you spent six years of your career here. Yeah. Uh, this is where you probably evolved the most as a professional. Is that fair to say? Definitely. So what were the biggest ways you evolve and transform at your time here? Any key lessons you pull from this restaurant before we need to take a break so, and start focusing on you and your businesses? So what was rad about Japango? And it, it really, I was at the time in my life where I was, you know, equal to go into university or grad school, whatever you want to call it. For me, it was a little bit of both. I mean, the other thing that was so interesting to me about uh, Japango was they were doing cool food that nobody had seen before. Mm. There was nobody nobody which, else doing that sort of thing at the time. I'm sure appealed to your like outside of the box creative side. Definitely. Yeah. And it 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 shot, you know, it was like uh, it was like giving it this weird mix of heroin and red bull and just <laughs> acid you know like it just turbocharged it in the best possible way um so you know that was going on but what was really cool about Japango was the volume you know you've got all these skills you've got all this pointer pointers you know you've got this this notebook you know how do you put it to the test well instead of going to the restaurant where you're going to cut like one yellowtail a day Japango we cut six you know two albacore you know anywhere from 20 pounds to 50 pounds of tuna a day, you know, just getting that, that practice. Cause yeah. you have, there are lessons that are learned in time and there are lessons that are learned in repetition and the really good less lessons are learned with both. So I needed to get my hands on some shit and there was tons of shit to get my hands on, nice. you know, from the bottom to the top. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was really, you know, initially it was like, am I really gonna, you know, come in and get, get, back on the bottom rung of the ladder after trying to, you know, but it, 
you know, I was in control of how fast I was able to move out of that to some extent, you know, there's always the waiting game. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's healthy, you was, know. Was there it, one individual at, I don't know why I'm struggling with the name of this restaurant, Japango? Japan, Japan. You got it. Got Japan it. Go. Nailed yeah. it. Uh, one person who, who influenced you the most. It was rad. I had, as far as the kitchen goes, and when I was there, so when I was doing rice, I was also cooking the appetizers, then at night cooking the appetizer f- for the sushi bar. So I was kind of got in more as a cook or prep cook dash cook and then went over to the sushi bar. So there were so many people to learn from. You know, in the span of time that I was there, um, there was uh, Amico was there in the beginning, who had a huge impact on the San Diego dining scene. Um, the name was Amico. Amico, um, gotcha. uh, Sudi, who is great chef. Uh, James Montahano, still the guy's like my brother, and he's watched out for me ever since we we worked together there. He used to come in my first job nice. when he was in school and give me crazy ideas and sneak beer over the sushi bar and <laughs> tell me about all this crazy stuff that was going on up in San Francisco. And then years later, he's the chef with um, another good friend of mine, uh, works for Michael Mina now, uh, Brian Brown, went to high school together. And, and, you know, so there are all these people that, you know, and people from my past and people that, so where normally you got like one chef and a small crew to work with, yeah. you know, there was honestly like 30 people over the course of the years I was there. Yeah. And that, um, again, that's the thing that's so powerful about going on, like doing whatever it takes to get onto these teams because success att- attracts success. Uh, it, Birds of the same feather flock it, together. You're going, there's yeah. a million different ways to say it. You're going to give yourself so much influence and so much access to incredible minds when you, when you sacrifice yeah in the short run to, to get on these teams. And you look right? at human history. Human history has progressed when humans communicate. Mm. Human history. Mm. You're I mean, to my soul right you know, now, dude. look at the dark ages, you know, like <laughs> there are a couple of reasons they were so dark, but one of them is people split, stop talking to each other. One of our biggest like, capability, our biggest, like, our it factor, I use this, this term it factor all the time as, as human beings is our ability to communicate and share knowledge. That's what separates us from all the, other monkeys in the world, right? In the, in the, the hominid yep. vertical, right? We can communicate better than anybody else. And when we have the same values, we can get on the same page. That's what allows us. That's culture. That's yeah. what allows us to operate in big groups. So when we work with people, when we share knowledge, when we communicate, we are 10 times better. Oh yeah. I'm a, I'm a Keep huge, I, I didn't mean to steal huge, huge believer in that. <laughs> um, obviously, uh, Jerry Warner and, um, James Holder. Yeah. The two, we had two head chefs there cause it was such a busy, busy restaurant they were huge impacts on me you know um they uh i mean they they were the two people who sat me down and told me i had to go to rehab the first time so that was more than just a boss you know and they gave me that option rather than just get out of here um and then there's a lot of chefs that i worked alongside like uh john park fish 101 still one of my favorite chefs a lot of anthony pascal has a psycho sushi chain Mm -hmm. Um, down south. I mean, he was he was one of the best men in my wedding. Ooh. So there's like lifelong friends and people who, the mentorship never stops. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, it's gonna be so hard for you to pick one thing, right? That how yeah. how you transformed during this time. But I guess the next question I have is, um, when did you start thinking about opening your own place? Why leave? You're with this group for six years, right? You you yeah. thought to yourself you're gonna be with the Hilton forever. What what changed in you to say I want to open my own place? I think after a while, you just get stir crazy. And there was, you know, Japango was a very successful uh, template, a very successful model. Mm-hmm. There were, September 11th was a huge, um, it, it was a gut punch for hotels. I mean, it was a gut punch for the nation. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot, a lot more negative effects than just what it did to the travel industry. And, you know, but just, um, just pointing it out because I was in the yeah. industry at that's, that time. That's the industry that yeah. you were most familiar with when it happened. So I had gotten to where we were going to open a uh, Cafe Japango in Aruba, and I was going to go to Aruba and open that. Ooh. And in the time between me signing a contract and actually leaving, like a matter of weeks before I was going to leave, um, that happened and uh, everything got put on that hold. Will, that will derail your your, yeah. your path for sure. Um so maybe now's a good time to take a break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to talk about how you started living intentionally to get your first business open. Cool. All right, we're back, and we just started talking about how you were on this track to open another uh, 
Japango in Aruba with then 9-11 happened and yeah. now you're starting to think well, maybe I should open my own place yeah well, um, real quick do me a favor push the top of that thing all the way down so you can get a little closer to the mic I just re- there's, oh there, that's it there we go we figured good it out. eye all right <laughs> keep that makes so, so much yeah, sense and there we go there, there's a, that magical voice I was looking for so uh take it from there okay so in that time that I was gonna go and didn't I realized how much I loved it here yeah um it was time I think it was mostly the quest for new experiences and, and knowledge, you know. Um, I mean, I could have stayed there forever and continued learning, but the curve had definitely leveled off a little bit. Um, and it was time for something new. Um, keep in mind, you know, with the conversation, I'm fresh out of rehab. Going to Aruba and Columbia is right there on the other side of the yeah. water. <laughs> so I, you know, um, and I had my out and... Uh, it was a good move because it probably wouldn't have picked up, you know, as we know now, it yeah. took years for everything to rebound. Yeah. So, you Wait, know, guess what was rebounding you, your health, your, what was going on? Um, the economy? I, I, I was, I was fine. Mostly the economy okay, and the okay. travel I just industry make sure and, wasn't... and all of that, gotcha, you know, gotcha. um, which putting myself in a pigeonhole like that, probably, you know, um, and you get to a point with, working for hotels where the only way to get promotions is to start jumping around or to wait for somebody to die or retire. Exactly. (laughs) That's what it takes to get a promotion in this place these days. Um, but, uh, so, you know, always been into surfing. My brother and me, um, you know, would surf and we go to this little restaurant called the Hill street cafe in Oceanside. Um, still love the place. It's, it's gone now, but, you know, it's a special time in the scene in Oceanside. And there wasn't a whole lot. There were some long-standing restaurants like Beach Break Cafe has been here. They're right across the street. They were in a different location. Um, Anita's Mexican food. But there just wasn't a whole lot in Oceanside. Not a whole lot of people. Like when I worked in La Jolla and I told people I come from Oceanside, they kind of take a few steps away from you because we had that reputation for having a little bit of grit up okay. here. <laughs> you know? Um, and it's a very different place now you know yeah. and now we're at the point where it's changing and we don't want it to change too much too much yeah. you know it's like whoa guys slow it down but um this cool little cafe where we'd eat after surfing uh we caught when the owner wanted to open a sushi bar okay and i just i wasn't at that point even planning on leaving i was still you know f- fairly happy at japango but i was definitely restless yeah um and i'm like look any you know this just happens to be what i do if you know if you're serious if you need about any, this, yeah, yeah, like, and even if you just need free help, I really like you and I like what you're doing with this place. I like, let me help you. Yeah, yeah. you know, I just want to see something cool. And he said, "Well, why don't you just come on board and, and be our partner?" I think that's a really so, important thing to to highlight right there. When you're looking to get something from somebody, don't put yourself first. Put them first and make it about them and yeah. how you can serve them and point out the benefits that will come to them with you know like don't yeah. don't make it all about you and i think that's one thing that you maybe not intentionally did but it's a great way to live to serve others and if you live oh. to serve others opportunity will come to you yeah somehow the universe takes care of you yeah it right? works really it well you never and know when it's going to work so don't be keeping tabs just yeah. know that it will come back to you because you'll be just dis- you'll be disappointed if you, like the, the, the world works in such weird ways right you'll and never be able to track it it might never match the initial picture you have in your exactly. head exactly but it'll be way cooler. And that, <laughs> that's it. how it was for yeah, me. You know? Exactly, right? So I, so basically he took you up on your offer and he said, well, instead of just, you know, um, me having you help me, I'm going to give you equity in the business. And you mm-hmm. come on. What was the, was it 50-50? What was the split? Um, God, I barely even remember. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it, it, it was something like that between Lauren and me. And, yeah. you know, um, and it was, you know, opening a restaurant, here then it was another one of those little kind of pay cut and step down i mean we had complete and total creative control and we were able to do some really fun stuff and you know anybody that worked at cafe japango you just said the j word and the press would be all over it yeah because it was big news everybody who left there went on to do something i'm sure that this owner who gave you equity in the business saw that that like i can try to yeah flounder on my own and compete with the best or i can recruit from the best and, and start at that point yeah. right um so what was it like take us through that process of, of making uh, this happen when at what point did you come on board um just when there was conversation of it all pretty much yeah. yeah you know um i you know in my head and then there was a 
a, a while before I, I left Japango, and it took a while to get open. And going at the Japango pace, I didn't want to go right into it. I wanted to be hungry and kind of missing it again. So I worked with um, my, my ex-wife. She was a bartender in an Irish pub that a friend of ours used to own. So I just worked as a bar back. There you go. And it was amazing. I think that's really important. I think when we're in the, the shit, you know, when we're hustling every day, working 80 hours, 90 hours a week, and, and, and just doing that, that takes so much energy, right? Yeah. We don't realize how much mental energy it takes to be creative, right? To slow down and to yeah. just put that energy into visioning and dreaming. And, and, and you can't force it. And getting clarity. It's going to pop up when it wants to. It's yeah. like recreation. You know, we think it means playtime. Well, that comes from the Greek word recreus, which means to recreate. So, okay. and, and, you know, I'm not saying like go on a leisure cruise or anything, but there are definitely points when you're trying to solve a problem and yeah. you're looking so close at it, you can't see the big picture, you know, and that could interpret to stepping outside, exactly, you know, but down. just at least step away, mm. you know, I love it. So how much time did you take away? Um, it ended up being a little while to get the place open. It got delayed a little, little bit and, um, like a year, it, it, less than a year. It was, it was a few months. Okay. But like six months, probably like three. Okay. Maybe. So three months to kind of yeah. get that clarity and figure out what yeah. you want to be, what direction you want to go. Um, knowing what you know now, this is a game I like to play, play, knowing what you know now, going through this process of opening this business, what would you have done differently? What reflecting back with all the knowledge and, and experience you have, would you have done anything differently? Would you, did you make any mistakes in opening this first location that you could have avoided? I've made, yeah, I've made tons of like mistakes. Like what? Um, well, by then, you know, just, just being a, a bit too much of a, a party animal. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was really, really fun. You know, I probably, I'm a unique mix because, you know, chefs and owners aren't always the same, uh, personality Say type. Say that one more time. What mix? Chefs and owners. Yeah. You know, like. You know, the owner's the businessman yep. and the chef, you Creative. know, and yep. a good chef can do both and a good owner can do both. Yep. But it really took me a long time to grow into that because I, you know, grow into an I, owner. Yeah. The, the other side of it, you know, what were you missing? The business smarts, like get specific. Um, just, um, just really running it like a business, M wanting to focus on cool food. Yeah. And. You know, that came above everything and really, you know, I should have built a better, you know, and then so what other aspects of the business you know, it sounds like earlier on, you're focused on doing really creative, cool food. And as you've e evolved and matured into the businessman you are today, other elements grew in priority. What were those yeah. other elements that and, and it was a survival, you know, you, f you figure it out to survive. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, you know, learning costing a menu and all that i mm -hmm. learned apprenticeship and a lot of my training was very food focused yeah when it came time to learn the business side of it I had a friend who went to johnson and wells so i stole his textbooks for a little while Pull that mic down just a him. little bit yeah don't be afraid to get the get in on it. that sucker yeah there you go <laughs> manhandle that mic um no so i you know read the textbooks and all the formulas and all of that you know what you don't always see there's a lot of hidden costs of doing business in a business, and that's what catches up with you. Yeah. And that one wasn't really my first business. Which so hidden costs were the ones that weren't on your radar at this time? God, 2000. Now keep in mind, 2004, I think I was 25. Yeah. And way too young to be running someone else's restaurant. Right. But I just took that leap of faith, and mm -hmm. I figured that I'd figure it out as I came along, you know? Which is true. Um, you know, you will. But, yeah. uh, what and, keep going and there's a lot of stuff that would probably be more a lot of stuff has changed from them then to now you know what it really costs to put food on a plate at a restaurant you know um how low the profit margins really are in well, restaurants i think a lot of people get in trouble because they'll they'll price out food items right but they yeah. only take into consideration the cost of the food and getting yeah. the return on the food. But what about labor? What about insurance? Yeah. What about rent? What about all these other variables that are expenses on top of the food that they don't take into account? Is that something that yeah. maybe you're... you're all that, that stuff. Yeah. Linen rental. Exactly. You know, That's, like... The and, list and, goes and on and on. All of these companies that you're, you know, they're all businesses too. Mm -hmm. So they're 
not looking out for you. They're looking out for them. <laughs> you might have a friendly sales rep, yeah. but that sales rep, you know, he's friendly with you because you're paying his car payment. Yep. You know, not saying that they're all like that, but yeah. you know, um, which is going back to where we are now, why it's so much nicer to as much as possible, strip it back, make things from scratch and have relationships mm. instead of these, you know, business arrangements. Yeah. So because, you know, even if you are paying more for this, it's um, you're paying for a family to go on vacation or you're paying for somebody's little league, you know, and you actually see it. And, you know, so it, a lot of that experience has kind of had. Well, I think I've you're bringing up shifted something that's, back. You yeah, know? you're bringing something up that's really important. And one of the, the early missions of this podcast was to help kind of transform the industry into more of a transform, like a transformative industry yeah. where it's about relationships and not so much about the transaction right and what you described before was the transaction like this guy's gonna be good to you because there's a transaction involved that's gonna pay for his new car but once when life is all about transactions it's like what's it all for yeah and it's about relationships right and when you can experience these relationships and see the end result of you choosing to give your money to this specific person in their business yeah. and now their kids can play sports right like that's the stuff that that's the gold yeah or whatever they want to do with it and really it goes back to the the only power we really have left in this society is voting with our dollar exactly which is you so know? powerful and people don't get that we it, have, dude it's way more can, powerful than relying on politi politicians to yeah. change the world right and it gets it gets you know if everybody does it at the same time it gets results way faster and when faster people think too. that that's unrealistic look at straws mm -hmm. where were we with straws a year ago right yeah I think about how many restaurants won't even put straws on the table or carry the so like the point is like one video can yeah. change the world today and we have to keep that in mind that it is possible because back to what we were saying earlier whenever there's an ability to communicate better we become more powerful as a unit and now literally anywhere in the world like you can share if you have um before it used to be whoever had the money had the message now it's whoever has the best message has the has yeah. the attention right it's so powerful i think we're kind of going into a little bit of a rabbit hole right now but, but it's uh, a good rabbit it hole. is a good i think we'll probably come back to this when we start yeah. talking about what you're doing with the plot um but Reflecting back at this time, before we start talking about um, your, your your first, I think, full service restaurant, right? Because yeah. the because this the the fish, I'm um, sorry, the fish, fish joint, joint was that catering only, or was what, oh, where were we here? So while at the fish joint, I started fish joint catering. Okay. Um, and it was cool because we found a niche. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of hotels that sell sushi. Um, and, you know, back then it was still kind of a wow factor to have somebody turn your living room into a sushi bar. That's cool. So we started and, and later on when we uh, when it was time for me to move on from that partnership, uh, I kept the catering side of things, That's which cool. still exists. So what happened with this changer. partnership that made you had to go uh, after about eight years? It just kind of it was it was time to move on again. You know, any um, lessons you can pull from this experience? Any was there was there disagreement on how the business should be run or not to like out anybody but yeah i mean it's important to note that we're still good friends and yeah I, I learned tons of stuff you know there was a lot of lessons i need to needed to learn like what from that um you know just being more business you know figuring out how to how to do the creative cool stuff but how to make it make money yeah you know how to manage your team it's it's a hard one because you don't your you don't staff becomes you know. your family yeah. and you care more about their well-being then you care about your own. Mm. But if the business, if the mothership doesn't stay healthy, then everybody goes down with it. Yeah. How did you, you know, how did you learn that lesson? The hard way. <laughs> is, is this take us to where that? Oh, well, no, I mean, I was always the advocate for the employees and, and past partners have been advocates for the bank account. And, yeah. you know, I, I fought that. Yeah. The way and, sorry, you know, keep going. Now, now that I'm on the other side, it's like, how do I, how do I be both? You yeah. know, you know, how do you, how, how do, do you, you evolve both? past? I mean, you got to evolve past the old equation. What is the old equation? The old equation is, you know, just the way Bottom things, line? the way things have always been done, you know, having, you know, a four time markup or having this, cause none of the old equations work anymore. Why not? Well, I'm putting you, this is what I do. I, the, ask, I take it, I pull back layers. And I think anybody who has a restaurant can agree with this, yeah. you know, um, unless you're in a big city, 
So, you know, a, a typical food cost equation, if there's labor involved, is four times your food cost. Okay. And that should include labor and everything, you know. The cost of labor and food has gone up disproportionately, right? We both know that, and we've seen it. We've heard cost about it. The cost of fuel goes up. It. That affects yeah. everything. These are just one, right. one example. Right? And the cost of labor also goes up for the vendors, so the cost you're paying for it on both sides, right? It comes to the end user, right? Yep. It all trickles but down. Now, that's where that's where the equation is ineffective. Okay. Because the one thing that has not changed proportionately is how much people are happy to pay for shit. Yeah. Because true. everybody's working twice as hard for half the money these days. So how do we change that? Well, we put more plants on the menu. We be more sparing with, um, you know, the cuts we're using, the portions we're using. I feel like anything that you can do to bring that cost down while still putting a healthier product on the table for your customers is a good thing. Um, you definitely try to go back to that whole not waste food thing. You know, you try to you use every walk, little bit. Right. You walk the walk. Yeah. And then I think the other thing that we do, which you do really well, is you educate the public. And I think that's one thing that we need to start doing better as an industry is educate the public Definitely. And, and let them know I can't you need to know what the cost of the food done right is we've gotten yeah. so far away from what real food is that we don't recognize it anymore because we just we're making it about the bottom line the, the entire time that we painted ourselves into this corner right where yeah. now we realize that, that just focusing on the bottom line means we get shitty food we put shitty food into our bodies yeah. people aren't healthy right I mean we're not doing it right and we need to change but that change is gonna shock the public because uh -huh. of what food done right cost right a organic chicken at the market costs like 25 dollars yeah. but we're used to spending five dollars at the grocery store because it's not done right so like yeah. these are just one example right but big companies are allowed to cheat why are we subsidizing coca-cola or corn you know which is yeah. you know a lot of what goes into coca-cola and you know like is, is like the whole why why is coca what why is a bottle of soda cheaper than a bottle of water not that we should be using plastic bottles to begin with, but yeah. like, y you know what I mean? These are things and, we should and, question. And, and, and so now we're paying for something that's kind of a human right, like water. You know, what's yep. next? Are we going to pay for air? Right. If Who they knows? can figure out a way to take it away from us and sell it back to us, they will. <laughs> There's I, probably I, I love, a team working on this right now. I love now. the conversation, man. I really you do. Know? I think it needs to be um, discussed more. Uh, I think we'll probably wrap up with this message. But um, moving on to the your storyline right yeah so you decided to go the the to, to, to part ways with the business owner that gave you this opportunity you get to retain the catering portion of the business yeah. which is huge you rebrand to um i think i said it in the intro the uh, pickled ginger catering and events and this is around the same time you meet your business partner jessica yeah who helped you with the rebrand right take us through what's going on at this point okay so jessica and me um we were at the tail end of other marriages we worked together at the fish joint Got you. And um, we're still together. My wife now. Yep. Um, and wife and business partner. Wife and say. business yep. partner. And it's very hard to be both, but somehow we're, we pull it off, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so we, you know, we keep the catering company, keep that going, um, discover this little place inside of a taco shop, rented it out. Um, and which is where we're sitting now, where we're sitting now. Got you. Um, what was it? What was appealing about the space? It for me, it was so out of one business out of a marriage, you know, fresh start. Basically, I was living in a box on the beach, Jessica's apartment, you know, nice. um, and all the stuff went away, you know, and it was just back to the basics. What happened when that stuff went away? Back to the basics. How did this change? I, you? I realized I didn't need it. Mm, like what? What's it? All of the stuff. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, you know, the material yeah, shit. Okay. You know, like all you really need. The whole value of everything was what was in our heads well, and our hearts the whole time. You bring up you know? a really important thing. And I think that when people are opening a restaurant, they have this vision of what they want their restaurant to be. Whether that, you know, 130 seats, right? Full service. Uh, employing whatever amount of people, 30 people, whatever the number is that you need to like execute that well. And it's, it's hard to go from zero to that. But when yeah. you get rid of all of your stuff and you're able to start where you can because you yeah. have no liabilities, then you can do a pop-up where it's you and one other person, right? Yep. And, and that's, that, that's the path you took. You got rid of all of your liabilities. So now you can afford to 
be small and nimble and yeah. figure it out. Because when you have stuff, stuff is expensive. Stuff limits you from what you're able to do. Um, do you want to dive in? I mean, my no, you're totally, you're totally here? right. So you got and rid of all the stuff, and what? Did, yeah. How did that set you up? It was perfect because all we really wanted to do was have some fun making cool stuff in a little shack on the beach nice. or close to the beach yeah. and eventually make a living doing it. So where, what was your path to execute this? Well, we quietly built a sushi bar behind a closed door in the middle of the night and, you know, uh, kind of got it to where and it's it was a definitely different than what's in here now. We got an electric fryer, electric cooktop. And just no sign or anything. We just quietly started started making food. Were you doing pop ups before that? Um, not not really. A brief time we were at the Red Rooster doing a sushi night over there. Okay. Um, and this one, like, we had the intention of staying. You know, we were able to make it a pop up for a little while. But as soon as as soon as we had what we needed to do what was going to be asked of us, and being inside of another restaurant helped. You know. Um, we went right to the necessary people and said, Hey, what do we got to do to make this a permanent as thing? As soon as you know? we had what we needed to do, what was asked for us? What did you need? Well, money. That okay. How much money did need. you think you would need at this time? Um, I mean the way we, in an existing building that had been built out, you know, there was probably about $30,000 worth of things that needed doing. Okay. Um, and that's still not even the full you know what you know th what you see now is another you know that restaurant you eventually see, yeah. moved out and, and a, we took that over and that's the whole you know, point of starting small so, is you start where you can and as you yeah. attract onto yourself the means then you scale slowly as you can yeah and that's i mean we'll get into that um it will come out in your story but thirty thousand dollars is not a lot of money for a restaurant like no. it, that that is so obtainable versus say getting a million dollars right yeah so where did you go to get this thirty thousand dollars? Because you didn't have anything, right? You said that you, you were living on the beach. How'd you get it? Earned it along the way. Okay. How long and did it take you to get there? Maybe took out a you know one of those high payback, high interest square loans from the guy down the, on, the, uh, on the corner. It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my kneecaps didn't get broken. Um, yeah, we um, you know we used Square to process our credit cards. Yeah. And they it works. You know, it's it's aggressive and they make their money, too. But it was helpful. But to at the us. same time, you know, you, you aren't just some schmuck that is just yeah. going like, let's open a sushi restaurant. Like you get at this point, I almost have 10 years of experience working at the best sushi places yeah. and in they, town. And they'd seen, you know, that it was the credit card processor. They yeah. saw the money that flew th that went through. Um, so you started small and then you had the transactions to say, look, look, we yeah. were established. Yeah, that's another big part. So. I think the big lesson here is to start where you can and, and make it as manageable yeah. as, 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 uh, leanly as possible. Yeah. Right. Um, so what we got the $30,000, um, what did, what happened next? Um, at that point we did a little bit of a remodel, got rid of the little electric fryer that <laughs> we probably shouldn't have had to begin with. Well, I mean, um, there's a lot of things too, when you're first getting started, just do it and ask for forgiveness later. You know, like I feel like, that's kind of what I'm saying without outright <laughs> saying it. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. you got to start where you can, and let's and be honest. Now, I would never, you know, don't go do it and say, David told me to do it. You know, <laughs> like, be smart. Don't ever put yourself at risk. Yeah. You know, there's but... A line, there's a line that you're going to walk, and sometimes you get across on both sides of that line to, to execute. As long as you're doing it morally, you know, you're not, like, yeah. burning anybody else in the process. And that but... was our thing, is every step of the way, everything was safe. I mean, yeah. probably safer and more ethical than what the big boys get away with doing for free, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's always gray areas, you know? Yeah. It's not black and white. It's not a black and white world that we live in. So three years after opening this spot, 2013 is when you open um, your uh, wrench and um, rodent sea bastro pub. What's up with the sea bastro pub? I, I, I gotta well, it was at a this. time when everybody was opening gastro pubs. Oh, okay. <laughs> and every step, you know, every part of that name is to poke a little bit of fun at, yeah, at something, nice. you know? Yeah. So um, since you're focusing on food and sushi, or sorry, seafood and sushi, yeah. sea gastro pub. Got it. And, and it kind of like that way we didn't have to commit to any one type of food. Okay. Because like, well, what is it, you know? Well, if you say Japanese and there's a bunch of English guys back there, you know, I mean, you know, that's, uh, you know, so you just say it's Sebastopol Fair. Nice. What's that? I don't know. 
<laughs> oh, what's that? You're eating it, you know? So after three years, um, what happened in your life that you were able to absorb the space next to you? That um, was your second restaurant, right? The, yeah. How did you even know you had the bandwidth? And where were you after three years or two well, years? And it's never, you know, not everything in life is a conscious decision. I think that, and this is the best advice that, that's worked for me, is there's different ways of doing things. There's having a will and having a plan. And I've never been a big, big plan of plans because plans can go wrong. You know, <laughs> being knowledgeable, flexible, and well-positioned is better than any plan out there because then when little gifts come your way from the universe, you're able to move fast and, it's, and take them. It's a difference you know? between a cruise ship, right? And yep. a jet ski. Yep. Um, a cruise ship, tons of systems. You need systems to operate a ship of that size. Yeah. But if you got to make a quick adjustment to avoid that iceberg, good luck. And, right. And, and, what, and that's what happens when in, like a, an, uh, the industry changing is an iceberg. And oh, if yeah. you, you know, like how are you going to adapt to that if you're so big and you have all these systems to be perfect oh. for that, whatever the, the current situation is. And, and what's more fun to drive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> always. So what happened was the, the taco shop that we were renting from moved out. So it was either take the spot over or find a new home. Mm -hmm. But by then this was our home because starting the way we did, there was a lot of love put into the place. I, I know it doesn't look totally like that but i love it man you I, know, love this, I love it, the feel of this place it's it's ours that's and, one thing no one can and i can't you know? say this now because it's gonna happen uh watch the video we're gonna have a video we're gonna walk around this entire place and you're gonna point out all the stuff we're talking about so definitely yeah so um so take it to the point where the the taco place goes out of business yeah they went out and it was you know we were able to um we're able to take just take over the entire lease and do a, a bit of a remodel and um have the whole kitchen so why which, not sorry keep on well um, which was nice because by then every step of the way the place is kind of you know you're growing but the the, the, the the size is yeah. remaining the same um why why rebrand or why do a whole new concept and not just blow out the wall and provide more seating for what you have i was having nightmares about a giant wrench and run it's <laughs> there are some things that you just don't you know I didn't want to make it too big. R Wrench and Rodent was never made to be massively scalable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, I wanted it to stay a jet ski. Yeah. So um, the other thing is, is with keeping it a jet ski, there was quite a long wait to get in here at times. And I wanted to give a quicker option of the same quality and just cast a wider net and do different stuff so creatively i was able to explore other yep. things so you, you're feeding that creative uh, hunger that you have uh -huh. and uh what about i mean I'm, I'm kind of i'm making assumptions here yeah um i'm assuming with a fish sushi restaurant fish focused restaurant you got a lot of byproduct bones things of that nature uh -huh. and what you opened was a noodle or a, a ramen place exactly I'm assuming you're 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 using fish stock right oh, yeah. so now you this product that you were probably just throwing away, or maybe you had other uses for it at this time, but now you have all this excess byproduct that you can put into launching a new separate product. So it's a very symbiotic relationship between these two restaurants. It is. Is that intentional? I'm assuming. Oh yeah. 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 So take us through that, th that thought good, process of good thinking catch on that one. Yeah. Well, um, take us through that. Well, I think the thing is when you have byproducts, there's uses for byproducts and there's optimal uses for byproducts. You know, just saying, okay, well, but we can compost it isn't good enough anymore. Mm. You know, mankind's kind of screwed up too bad. So mm -hmm. we need to use everything for its highest intended purpose. Plus, that's like how you respect the product the most is for its highest intended purpose. So, you know, throwing the bones in the fryer and letting somebody nibble on it like a crisp <laughs> isn't as cool as babying it for 18 hours until you get this flavorful broth. Yeah. That, you know, plus that you also have the summer and winter time. Uh, things going on you've got uh, the ebb and flow of economies you know you have a more expensive place and a, a cheaper place and you know recessions happen it cycles it's yep. like the tide so when that when that happens it you know you're you're kind of covered you're you know you're you're betting high and you're betting low at the same time okay um and then um just really wanting to be able to because it's, it's a ramen shop but it's kind of more of like an izakaya one of my favorite thing to make is little small plates. It's my favorite way to eat, so it makes sense. It's my favorite way to eat. So yep. 
it's an outlet for every crazy idea that can fit on a plate this big and go out for eight dollars. That's you know? cool. And I think the other thing that's important: the, your um, wrench and rodent's a full service restaurant, is it not? Yeah. 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 And then the wet noodle, literally, I'm looking at it from where we're sitting. I'm looking at it. It's through that doorway right over there. Um, that's counter service. So you're adding this whole other appendage onto your business with very minimal additional other logistical par- moving parts. Because yeah. now you're not full service over there. You can order at the counter. So you yeah. can. Was that intentional, too? Or did you start off full service over there and dial back? How did that evolve? Um, that was intentional. And it's the same kitchen. Yeah, you know, it's basically it's basically a taco shop. So you're you're there. basically saying, how can Still. I add this additional vertical of revenue to my business without doing, or, or uh, with doing as little as possible to add new things yeah. within? How can we just let the the byproduct flow over uh-huh. to the, the given new shop? given what we have, given yeah. the shell that we have to work. So with how many in. more people did you have to hire to open a second restaurant? Maybe like five. That's freaking awesome. In the, in the beginning, <laughs> yeah. there's, so, there's more now. But. So when you when you are able to scale, like literally from the inside out to like the you literally swallow the building right next to you, right? Yeah. You don't have to. You, you can be in one spot, and you don't have to have that presence in multiple locations too. Did that serve you well? Oh, super well. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah. else that I'm missing that is worth bringing to the surface? Knowing what you know now, reflecting back at the success you've had over the past since 2016, three years, right? Um, that is worth highlighting that I'm just not yeah. seeing. Well, the history books usually only remember the successes, you know? Yeah. And anybody's going to have a similar path. There's going to be way more failures. And there has been in my case, yeah. you know? Um, Give us a couple of those failures that were the most transformative for you that left you better off after having the perspective you have now. God, there's... Um, I tried starting a, a retail food company, and that, that was a big failure. What happened? Um, it just it was a little too ahead of its time, and it should have been a luxury product, and it got kind of put in the value-added product mix. You know, okay. We tried to get it into uh, schools and stuff, and so if you could have done it all over, what would you have done differently that you think? Not a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, every step is alert, you know. Um, how did that leave you better off? What not, what new knowledge did you garner from this experience? I mean, you got to look at life in more ways than just financial benefits, Mm -hmm. you know, um, financially it definitely didn't, but the knowledge you get to keep that, you get to keep it, you get to add to it, you get to run with it, you know, and as we build the plot, there's the potential for retail products and all of those lessons, have just been sitting there, even getting better. It's Give almost us. like putting money in a bank account with interest. Because so, you put an idea in your head, your brain doesn't stop messing with it and picking it apart, and you know. Yeah. So, um, and and all that stuff's going to be helpful. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, so, um, any other lessons that we can take before kind of giving you the opportunity to freestyle and talk about something that's near and dear to your heart that we haven't discussed yet? I mean, what's your what's your plan for the plot? I guess is where so I'm going with this. The plot is going to be a plant based restaurant. Technically, it will be vegan, and we we love vegans too. But we wanted to take a a plant based menu, um, cook to vegan criteria, and make it appealing to everybody. Um, you know, to date, you kind of got hardcore meat eaters on one side, yeah. hardcore vegans on the other, and a bunch of people in the middle. Mm-hmm. We don't want it to be like a place where we're telling you how you should eat all the time, how you should think, because let's face it, there's enough people telling us how we should think right. on both sides, on all sides. It's overwhelming. You know, it's like, you know, so we don't want to be those people. We just want to offer a really cool alternative and have some fun doing cool stuff with plants. And we don't want it to be like, you know, I mean, somehow the vegan diet, and I guess that's their definition of what they are. You know, it, it's, all, it's all it's all or vegans? nothing. You yeah. know, vegans. You know, it's, it's all or nothing. It's religion, and and yeah, and you know what? I have respect for everybody and their decisions and all of that. But how much of a positive impact could we make if we went to this lo- this biggest group of people in the middle and just got everybody eating a little more plants? Yeah. How many more animals would that save than the 
extreme people on this side trying to convert the extreme people on that side. And I mean, it's like the holy wars, right? Yeah, no well, one's ever going to change. What I like about what you're sharing with us is that I think people feel like they have to be extreme to, to yeah. deliver a message. And what you're saying is we're just going to be neutral, but we're just going to add a ton of value to show people, listen, plant-based diets can be delicious, right? Yeah. And healthy and better for the environment, but you're not doing it aggressively. And honestly, we live in a world today where there's we have so much information and our brains were not meant to process the amount of information that is at our disposal right now not just information but opinions yeah. and sides and we're where media is exists today to i feel like put people against each other oh yeah right? and the, the, the if we're only if we're gonna evolve and get past this we need to approach everything with an open mind that's the only way we're going to survive the future right is if we have that open mind and it seems like it seems like recognize that definitely yeah. i i'm and, but the thing is, is I'm not going to tell people how to think to get that. I mean, how many people base important life decisions, political affiliations, votes, opinions on articles they see on Facebook that they probably only read the headline and not the article? Exactly. Right. It's like, it's, you know, it's all so fast you, and so shallow. You also can't shallow. blame people at this time it's because like, of the environment that we live in, you know? Well, it's been done for a reason, you know, and it's. Dude, it's in our pocket. It follows us around. I am, you know? I'm openly horrible at social media and horribly horrible just looking at screens in general. I inv I, I involve or I exist in the physical world. Me too. And um, I think you know it's weird because I li I have this business podcast right where it's my job to share knowledge and and I feel like I should be better about promoting technology and how to use technology and how to use mar technology for marketing and all this stuff. But at the same time, I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of. Yeah. The relationships, right? Yeah. We can't automate every aspect of our business because then we lose, we grow distant from the people that make this thing worth worth all the hard work, right? Um, do you want to reflect on what I'm saying right now, or am I, lo am I losing you? <laughs> no, it's, it's it's a tool. It's yeah. not a replacement. Exactly, and it's, we lean too much on these tools, right? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes yeah. we do. Cool. So, one question um, I've been asking all my guests. Uh, the mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. How have you transformed? Who are you today? Who Who's the man you are today versus the man you were getting started in this industry? I think I have a more focused idea of what it is I want to do and what it is I don't want to do. I think I'm a lot more comfortable in my own skin now. Mm. Um, what do you want to do now? Um, I mean, honestly, I want to change the world for the better by doing cool shit to right. put it the most simple, you know, um, and have fun. Cause it's gotta be fun. Yeah. And hopefully other people have fun too. How do you, you plan know? on executing that? Um, the plot's a big part of it. A lot of it is, it's not the exciting answer. It's putting one foot in front of the other. It's the day in day out, you know, being the guy that throws the fish skin in the cup instead of the trash can, even though years of, muscle memory have taught you to just throw that yeah. shit in the trash can you know like it's all the little things there's no one big secret the secret is all of these tiny little things that add back together to become a big thing yeah and one thing i picked up on my research uh getting prepared for this conversation is your uh desire and willingness to make it about everybody else in the process and i want to take this opportunity to applaud you for that uh in a time where you live in this community oceanside california where it's scaling it's growing you haven't looked at your neighbors as competition. Uh, you flipped it and said, this is about us. How can I grow my business and then do so grow other people's business and to make it about the community and make decisions based off of how you're going to impact other people. Uh, I want to highlight you and your ability to do that and your priority in doing that um, and give you an opportunity to reflect on that if you have anything to oh, say. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I found it's collaboration, not competition, you yeah. know, and out of out of that way of thinking, you know, and everybody else who's a part of that deserves just as much credit as I do. But, um, you know, it's, it's a big family. Yep. I mean, it's, it's our tribe, you know, it. um, we, we watch each other's back. I mean, and that, that's why I have three restaurants and they're all in Oceanside. Yeah. You know, the plot will eventually go out into the big scary world and hopefully have locations all over the place. But like the first one had to be, here because it's home yes and we have you know you talk about support system yeah I mean, there are also people who understand we understand each other's struggles because we're all doing the same thing we're all up against the same set of cha challenges similar sets of challenges and um 
mean, I've been super fortunate to be in a climate where other people kind of share my views on, on how we should help each other. I love you know? it. I love it. Awesome stuff, man. Uh, we're going to take one more quick break to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back to bust out a speed round. You're awesome. killing it, by the way. I love this. We're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Waking up every morning excited about life. Ooh, that's a good one. What is your biggest weakness? Uh, right now, smoking cigarettes. And uh, maybe for business, I think my heart might be a little big, but it's also a strength, so it's kind yeah, of Yeah, and that, that happens a lot where your strengths are often your weaknesses. Um, it's just one of those things. It's how the world works. It's, yeah, I just learn to live with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're growing your team and interviewing people? Were you born to do this? How do you know if they're born to do it? Um, sometimes they tell you. Sometimes it's in how they tell you. Yeah. And sometimes it's in how they fight telling you that they weren't. You know? <laughs> it's just, uh, you just kind of study them. And, 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 and it, sometimes it's guessing. What is your biggest challenge today? Um, Quitting cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, how are you overcoming that challenge for anybody else that's out there with the same challenge? Dude, honestly, right now, I'm not even trying. I got to get to the point where I'm ready to try. You know, I've, I've quit before. but I, I love the know. honesty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. This is a core value, a way to be, a way to act. If it's not wow, don't send it out. If it's not wow, yeah, don't if, send if it out. If it doesn't make you say fuck yeah, then nice. you know, that's, nope. that's what it should be. That's, that's what we standard. should strive for. I love it. Uh, share one uncommon standard of service you teach your team. So this is something that's common within your four walls, how you go above and beyond to serve the guests, but not common for the rest of the industry. Dude, I think the, the tasting menus are, you know, common would be to have some sort of structure there. And going to the business side, it's hard to quantify stuff. How do you keep up with a menu that changes every day or changes every minute? But, you know, all of those tasting menus, it could be six courses, it could be 36 courses, and the whole time people are being watched and we're trying to figure out what they're going to like best and how to keep the progression going. So it's kind of like total off the cusp, you know. Um, that's pretty uncommon because even in places where it looks like it's off the, you know, there's there's a program, there's a formula. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I can, can I can vouch that you guys are kind of very free flowing in the service because when I sat down, when I came in, your brother, the sous chef, what's, what's your brother's name again? Remind L me. Lauren. Lauren. What, say it one more time. Lauren. Lauren. Yes. Um, he looks very similar to you. And I he had me fooled. Even after like watching videos of you and seeing photos of you, he I thought he was you. So you guys have fun with it. Like you play oh, tricks, yeah. you know, like you make it human. It's not like robotic. Right. Um, is that kind of an example of what you're talking about or am I yeah, stretching? Yeah, and we want, I mean, we want to put high end food out, but we want it to be like a neighborhood pub. Nice. I dig it. So what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant owner? One book. Yeah, you, know, you could, <laughs> the art of war oh. <laughs> management, uh, man, man, management techniques of Attila the Hun. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure if I heard that one. <laughs> no, they're, uh, they're, it is a book, and it's pretty funny. Okay, nice. And there, there are things that you're like, whoa, you know, <laughs> just just for giggles. I mean, books, I mean, Kitchen Confidential was fun because it puts the humor in it, and it yep. reminds you, you know. And, and at the time, you know, when, when we were all a bunch of animals in a restaurant, when that book came out, we were reading it like, we're normal. <laughs> this is what everybody does. You know? I love it. Uh, what's one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? Um, God, that's a hard one without getting myself in trouble. Um, you know, honestly, um, I, it's, it's easy. Is value their own time. Mm. It never gets added into the equation. Yeah. What their time is worth. That's huge. You know, and, and uh, how do you figure out what your time's worth? Honestly, I haven't figured it out. <laughs> you know, I mean, you try you try to stick with it, but you know, well, it's always easy... Sorry, go ahead. Well, you know, it's, it's if you can get something twice as fast done twice as fast and somebody needs something, you don't want to say you, you don't want to say no to the customer. Yeah, I ever, think one way to look you know? at it too is like what is your what do you make a year? What's your your annual revenue, right? You, what do you make as an yeah. individual? 
what is that divided by, you know, whatever 40 hours a week is in a work week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like whatever that number is, um, figure it out. And if, if your return on something yeah. doesn't match that number, then be, you know, I mean, we, it's good to be generous with your time too. Yeah. You don't always have to be a, a, you know, stiff about it, but that's one way to figure yeah. out what your time is worth. And then on Put the, it, it puts it into pr- perspective on the other side is, you know, what, what, what would you pay them to, to see your kids high school play or whatever, you know, yeah. like what's the value 20 years down the road? What would you pay then to have that moment back? Mm. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've missed out on a lot of stuff because of, because of this and I'm not, not complaining about it. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably do it the same, yeah. but like, you know, for other people, the least I can do is point it out and, you know, don't look the other way. Think about it. You know, mm-hmm. maybe you can't be at every high school play, but go to every other one, you nice. know, because at the end of the, at the end of the day, those are about. the moments you're going to miss. Yes. I love it. Um, so this is a new question. What is one service you've hired? When I say service, I'm looking at like people behind the service, whether it's like a consultant, uh, like what's one service that you, you, you've outsourced to that you've been more than pleased with. It could be uh, marketing. It could be design. It could be anything that you reached out to another service you've outsourced to make your restaurant better. On the plot, the team that's built it, because, you know, coming from here, you know, you get the picture of me in here on my hands and knees with a hammer at four in the morning when the other restaurants closed. Yeah. Um, we had Cultivate um, building the restaurant, um, Solstice Interiors doing the design, and um, the team that they've put together has been amazing in building new restaurants. As far as existing restaurants, um, so that was Solstice Interior. Yeah, gotcha. uh, you'll see the sign when we go over there. Gotcha. But uh, and, and cultivate, um, you know, construction. Just taking it to where we haven't really had to worry about a thing. You know, nice. it's it's and it's you'll see the size and scope of the project when we go over there too. It's it's pretty massive. Nice. Um, that's been that's been huge because you think about these things and it's it's going back to the previous question. It's what's the value of your time? You know. Can I do a lot of that stuff myself? Yeah. Can I do it anywhere close to the level of professionalism that they can do it? No. Hell no. And I think that's... And and how much money could I have made in the meantime doing what I do best? You know, it's... Exactly why I'm asking this question. The tribal separation, you you, know? Yeah, yeah. I think think people think that they have to be good at everything to be successful in this industry. And the truth is the most successful people in this industry are where they are because they know what they're good at and they outsource the rest. Yeah. And it it doesn't, I guess it's it's a very privileged place to get to when you have the means to outsource. But when you get to that place, as soon as you get to that place, as soon as you can eliminate something from your own like workload, then do it because you'll be able to do what you do best that much better. Oh, totally. So that's why this question is, there so we can find out who these other companies are the outsource for in that area so awesome awesome answer there and uh the last not the last question i'm I'm so used to number 10 being the last question uh what is one piece of technology you've adopted within your four walls that has had a huge impact on technology well sorry on business not technology. it's crazy because all of these between the fish joint and this restaurant these didn't exist in the first restaurant i mean i think yelp came about yeah um and not to, it's kind of a bad word in some circles to say, <laughs> Yelp. but, uh, watch your language, it, man. <laughs> yeah. To, sorry. Um, but you know, that came about halfway, when, when, you know, or at least came on my radar halfway yeah. into the, the time I was at the fish joint. Um, I mean, iPhone is great because I really don't get normal office time. Yeah. So to have everything uh, a, that, a you know, distance away. Yeah. Yeah. And then I don't have to leave my real office to do, you know, it, which is, it's getting more and more. And eventually I'm going to have to stop working for my restaurant and start working for my business, which is not why I signed up for this, yeah. you know, but it's, you know, I, I, I owe it to, is there one specific app on your smartphone that you're using that you can share with us? Well, the, like the POS systems are like an app that, yeah. you know, now it's all iPad based. So what, what platform where, are you going with? Uh, this is toast. Okay. And I think it, it will be at the other restaurant too. Um, there's breadcrumb. Uh, th- there's a few others, you know, and you know, it takes away the POS system used to being the super expensive, crazy thing. Yeah. And it makes it so everybody can have one and have access to it 24 yeah. seven. Like you're saying, what, which is one feature I'm assuming with your phone, you can log. Yeah. How does that work? You, um, it's, I think it dumps into other accounting, um, 
uh, programs. Uh, there's an app on my phone where I can keep an eye on things. So Toast integrates with your accounting platform, which yeah. is. That's Jessica's side. Okay. Of, uh, it might be QuickBooks that, or something along those uh, lines. I there's believe. QuickBooks. Uh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I, Point I, being I, uh, is Toast is very um, compatible with a lot of other yeah. platforms. And, and, and integration and is very important. User friendly. Yeah. And um, God, I, I know what it is. I just, uh, I don't want to waste precious air time. No, thinking, you're good. Thinking you're good. about it. Um, yeah. But the other is uh, Instagram and social media. You know, it, it's a tool and it's something you shouldn't get lost in. But like that form, you know, people don't watch people watch TV on their phones now. So the fact that the thing that you have a way to get everybody get their attention in their pocket. Yeah. And you have tools that can get things that are interesting to them kind of levels the playing field. Yeah. It does. You know, because Again, it's back. That's not who has the money has the message. Yep. It's who has the best message has the attention, yeah. uh, which is really powerful of fragmenting those channels of communication. And, and I love that in all aspects of our society. Yes. You know? Um, okay. This is the last question. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Brace for impact. It's a doozy. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you and your work in your restaurants would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your own legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? Um, try to make a difference. Things don't have to be perfect to get, you know, just don't worry about things being perfect. You'll get there eventually. Just do it. Don't mm. feel that, you know, don't wait around for the right moment because it will never. It's like, when do you have a kid? You know, yeah. there's no right time to have a kid. You right. know, you just, hey, you're either going to have a kid or not. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it just happens. Yeah. You know, um, number three is, uh, you know, be good to each other. Try, try not to let this try not to let the quest for survival rob you of your dignity. I love it. Dude. You know, Chef David Wait, this has been a great conversation. We wrap up every chat by calling somebody out in a good way. Who do you respect and admire and believe would make a great guest mentor like you've made for us today? Preferably an yeah. independent or small franchise chain operator. I'd say Drew Brent from Lola 55. Drew Brent. Yeah. Look out, Drew Brent. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you on the show. And uh, how can we connect with you? If uh, we want to come join your team, and even that means making rice for like six months, uh, um, what's the best way to connect? <laughs> to find me, yeah. um, Dave and Wait on Instagram. Um, my email is super easy. It's just my name at gmail.com. Yep. And um, a website, you want to drop one of those on? Uh, www.cbastropub.com. Nice. And then uh, theplotrestaurant.com. And this is episode 600. And 79. So head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash, slash 679. I'll have a summary of today's discussion as well as a link to any books or service that are recommended and how to connect with Chef Davin. Uh, just again, thank you so much for taking thank the time. You. It's, it was my pleasure. Uh, it was an honor to, to make an example of you. And there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah.